So the first thing I want to say is that I appreciate Chantel giving me the opportunity to address all of you the, uh, today. And uh, she said, this is the, I'm the kickoff session for a new year, a new season of amazing Science Circle presentations. For those of you that are new, uh, Science Circle is an organization of PhD level scientists that every Saturday we each take turns uh, talking about the research that we're doing, what we're uh, trying to bring everybody up to speed on, you know, what's going on in our individual fields. I'm mostly a geologist and a paleontologist, as you can see, but I'm also very much interested in technology. Uh, I do have one disclaimer, and that is that those of you that came to hear my talk back in, I think it was March, at Virtual World's Best Practice in Education, uh, some of this is going to appear very similar to you, like maybe the first 15 slides, because um, there's a part of it that I decided I shouldn't change in my talk here. Um, but please stick around. Uh, there is new content. Uh, in July of 2024, I went back to the Virginia Museum of Natural History to release a new virtual reality simulation for the Lake Cretaceous. So I'm going to be sharing with you the results from that exhibit for those of you that couldn't get to the Virginia Museum of Natural History. So um, basically, I wanted to talk today about virtual reality in science and education. Uh, one of the things I want to go through is I have my local chat open. So if you have a question or a comment about something that you see in the slides or that I say, uh, feel free to post it in local chat and I'll do the best I can to answer it. Uh, my talk, talk lectures usually go for about 30 minutes, and that allows 30 minutes for question and answers, uh, usually embedded in the talk, uh, so we get out of here about an hour. Um, I try and keep everything to within an hour because I know you've got most likely things to do in real life like I do. All right, um, so when you think virtual reality, I know one of the first things that usually pops into people's mind is meta. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg spent billions of dollars acquiring the rights to Oculus, and uh, of course he couldn't waste any time uh, releasing the Rift, then the Oculus Go, then the Quest 2, the Quest 3, the Quest Pro. So uh, Facebook, aka Meta, um, is definitely trying to make inroads in um, the whole virtual world, metaverse thing. Um, I've been to Horizon, that is their main program for the Quest 2, and uh, the first time I went in, I uh, was disappointed. Uh, it was mostly cartoony graphics, and the reason is they want low polygon graphics so that it would run on their Quest 2 headsets, uh, on the headset themselves. And um, to be honest, there were problems from the start. Everybody knows that if you put a bunch of kids in on a platform in a world where there's no supervision, they're going to do dumb things. So when I went in there, they were making racial comments, they were making sexual comments. Uh, there were parent groups that were going in and videotaping everything and releasing it on NBC News, which got the attention of Meta, of course. So the next thing they did was they said, we're going to have some kind of supervision here. And so they decided to um, put in well, the first thing they did was they said, we're going to allow 30-second video snapshots of what's going on here that's reported back to Meta. Uh, the next thing they did was they put in what are called community guides. These are Meta employees that bop into the horizon and make sure that the kids are somewhat behaved, um, although I did still see some racial and sexual comments, but not as many, much. Um, they tried to guide them in the right way to use the platform, which I think is really good. You have to have some kind of supervision. 
Um, at least they cannot carry the AR-15 they got from. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I was going to say so, a tagline. As long as you brought it up, then fine. I'll say something about that. Um, I think we're all familiar with uh, the incident that happened in Georgia where a teenager went into a school and killed two teachers and two children. And that's just, not just Georgia. That's also uh, Virginia. My school that I taught at, I taught high school for 33 years. Um, the schools in Virginia were getting similar threats on social media. Uh, one school, Pulaski, shut down on Friday. Another school, my school, decided to maintain classes. Uh, there was an incident in Arizona, I was told last night, where um, at least one or two students brought guns to school, but they, they were not loaded. There was no ammunition. The students were caught. They were suspended. So it's a real problem. And what does this have to do with VR? Um, it is everything. There are parents that are going to look and say, our kids are just, it's too dangerous. Um, and I refuse to send them to a public school where we've got all these chances of shootings. And so the question then becomes, you know, what are the alternatives? And I know in Virginia, there's a virtual Virginia program where kids can go stay at home and get virtual instruction. Um, I was just on Meta Horizons talking to Meta employees about, you know, why Meta doesn't have virtual classrooms using the Horizon platform. Uh, where kids can be taught in a virtual environment using VR. Um, they don't yet, but I think that's something that they are considering. So this definite ties in to virtual reality, the, the Ready Player One scenario. Um, we'll get into that more in detail. All right. Um, so Meta, I think, is trying to take a step into education, but they still realize that there's problems. They even acknowledge on the login screen, okay, that, um, you know, that there's some maybe may some material in these experiences, okay, that are going to be objectionable to some people. By the way, they've now taken that disclaimer off. I just went in this morning, and that's not there. All right, um, I, for the most part, um, although I use uh, Meta equipment, I use the Rift and the Quest Two. Um, I basically use it with link cables to gaming rigs. And instead of using Horizons, I prefer um, a more graphic-rich environment. So I use the Unity 3D game engine to create educational content, virtual field trips. I went out to Denver in 2022 and uh, met uh, or worked with the staff at Dinosaur Ridge, and they were very willing to work with me to get uh, a couple of educational sims up, especially when I showed them what the work that I had done in Virginia. So the idea was to create um, the idea was to create dinosaur simulations. What would it be like if you could go back in time and um, actually have an experience of being with dinosaurs? Uh, one of the things I really like about Unity when I first tried it back in 2017, 2018 is that they had support right out of the box for the Oculus Rift headset. If you're familiar with Unity, all you have to do is drop a first-person controller um, into Unity, and boom, you know, you can create VR racing games, you can do tours of Mars. I was absolutely shocked at how much support there was for VR for Unity between 2017 and 2019. And I started a computer club at my school where students were making these virtual reality simulations, and they did quite well. All right, uh, in addition to making single-player VR simulations, there's a plugin called Extremality that allows you to create multiplayer VR virtual worlds. And I worked with Kevin Tweedy at Extremality, and uh, she, he showed me how to, within a half an hour, to add avatars. You put male and female avatars in there. You could put kid avatars in there. You could put chat in there. It doesn't, doesn't platform doesn't support voice, but it's pretty cool. Um, you can even create user interfaces, as you see here, where it displays how many dinosaurs you've found, how many guests have actually taken part in an exhibit since you're doing this at a museum. Um, the, both the Virginia Museum of Natural History and Dinosaur Ridge asked me to put a timer in there because we don't want one or two guests monopolizing the VR equipment for hours so that other people can't see it. So three to five minutes seemed to be the time period 
uh, that that they were recommending and seemed to work. <clears throat> All right, so this is uh, the first uh, simulation I came up with for the Jurassic. Um, by the way, one of the reasons why the Virginia Museum of Natural History actually liked the idea of using virtuality with um, and multiplayer with guests is that when you go in and you're in the VR environment, you get a, an immersive feel. You get a feel of scale. And all the dinosaurs that I put in my simulations are designed to scale. So when the Camarasaurus rears on its hind legs, you get a feel for how big this animal is. And the fact that you've got an avatar in there as well further emphasizes um, further emphasizes that you get this sense of scale. And Cisco is going to dinosaur reach its head up that high without passing out. Um, I would think so, uh, because, you know, I, I mean, the anatomy is, is what they basically use to decide the animal probably reared up on its hind legs. Camarasaurus has a, um, has longer forelimbs than, than hind limbs. So it's designed for pushing the, pushing the body up so that the animal um, can reach higher foliage. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I point out here um, is that um, we're dealing with Denver. Okay, so you think high elevations. Um, but at the time, when the, we're talking about the Jurassic, there were no Rocky Mountains in North America. Everything was pretty close to sea level. Ignore the mountains that are in the background there. I probably should have taken that out. Um, and so say even giraffes have problems with super high blood pressure. I didn't know that. Okay. But no, you're not dealing with big elevation changes. Um, and, uh, oh, you talk about blood pressure. Okay. I don't know if that's something that scientists have looked at. And that's why I love doing these talks. I have a meeting on September 24th at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, um, with the curator there. Um, and so I can ask him about that. Of course, the problem is one of, you're talking about the soft parts of an animal that's been extinct for 150 million years, but it's an interesting thought, especially if you compare it to giraffes. All right. So in July of 2023, the big day finally arrives and, uh, I'm at the Virginia Museum of Natural History for their dinosaur day festival. And uh, the museum allowed me to hire up to five people. I got three, actually four, uh, to help me out. Uh, Darian Bradley was a former high school student that I taught. He's, he was now at Virginia Tech. Brandon Delt was an amateur paleontologist. And I was able to get Logan Howell, who worked for the Virginia Department of Energy. He's, he's quits that job now. Um, but uh, Logan actually worked out west on the uh, Morrison Formation, the Jurassic Morrison Formation. So it was cool to have a team that understood the technology as well as, um, you know, understood the, the science as well. So we had a great turnout in 2023. Uh, the fact that it was virtual reality, it was multiplayer, was really cool. Uh, if I had a family where there were like two children, two sons coming up, um, they could play uh, multiplayer in the VR simulation and, um, you know, see each other in the game. We also had a computer set up so parents could sit down and run around the simulation and see what the, the parent, what the children were doing. All right. And here's, here is a screen capture showing uh, two of the kids running up to an Allosaurus and uh you know exploring that and one of the things i did was uh, an rpc so that when the kids were running around uh when one one child found something it shared it with other children that were logged into there so that it, it was sort of a team-based approach to what they were doing and it wasn't just children that uh, enjoy the VR simulations. I also had adults coming by and trying it. And here's a, here's a couple uh, that logged in with the headset. And this is what it looked like in game. So, um, you know, I could put, I had both male and female avatars so that they could run around and, and make these sort of discoveries. All 
All right. So um, I had sort of an expectation when I went to Virginia in 2023. I thought what would happen is that uh, the younger children would just want to play the simulation on a computer and the older children would want to do the virtual reality thing. Um, and Meta recommended that um, uh, Meta recommended that uh, children under 13 not use their their hardware for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the ones I found out is that their fingers are too short and it's hard for them to con to control the con uh, controllers. And uh, Aaron's bringing up uh, I have an Oculus, but I get such bad motion sickness. Um, I've done hundreds of children with uh, Oculus Quest 2. And yeah, every once in a while, I'll get somebody say that, yeah, they're uh, having motion sickness. And my answer is, well, just take the headset off. Um, I always have PC versions in addition to the VR versions so that uh, they can see, uh, you know, they can see the same thing without the, the VR headset. But if you look at the pie chart here, um, overall guests generally prefer the VR multiplayer. It was like 78% to 23% people prefer the VR headset. I had students that could have played it on just a PC, but decided that they were willing to wait, okay, to um, get the headset on. And, that, and that's fine. And I'm, and I'm not sure why it is that people still get motion sickness uh, because Manufacturers of the headsets have tried to fix that. Um, I know they've upped the frame rate speed to about 90 frames per second or 120 frames per second. So they're they're trying to do that. I, I'm on VR headsets sometimes for hours and I, I don't feel it. So um, I'm not sure why some people get affected by it more than others. But like I said, um, um, it's a relatively few people that I see getting sick on uh, these headsets. All right, so after going to the Virginia Museum of Natural History, the next thing I did was I went back to my high school and got permission from my high school to do a study at uh, high school with science students. And the reason for this was, even though I found out that the, that the guests at the museum liked uh, the VR simulation, I, I didn't know if they were learning anything. So I went back to my high school and what I did was I asked the students to take a pre-quiz while I was doing attendance, while the teacher was doing attendance, and then go through the VR experience and then take a post-test. So I wanted to see if they learned things, okay, using the virtual reality um, rather than just if I had gone there and lectured. All right. Um, as they were running around having the VR experience, um, as they ran up to a dinosaur, there were pop-ups on the screen. And one of the things that Dinosaur Ridge wanted uh, me to go into is a how do we know what we know sort of approach to paleontology. So they gave me permission to go around the Dinosaur Ridge, take pictures of anything that I wanted to. Uh, one of the things I saw out at the Dinosaur Ridge were these things called um, dinosaur bulges. They're these spherical formations in sandstone layers. And somebody figured out that they represented um, where these big, heavy sauropods were pounding their feet into the sediment and creating these features. Well, it's time for some results here. And unfortunately, I expected to see better results than I actually got. Um, I thought virtual reality would, would excite the students, motivate them to learn more. All the information on the pre-quizzes were in the game. All they had to do was read it. Um, and um, I was so surprised that I only saw a 10% increase when I hit the pre-quiz, then I put them through the experience, and then a post-quiz. And um, yeah, Dolly says maybe they were their time limited for their head raises. Um, I thought about that. And when I was at the high school, I said, look, if you need more time in the experience, take it. That didn't seem to affect the score as much at all. Um, I know at the museum I was greatly limited, but in the high school I could give them more time. Um, it didn't seem to make much of an effect on there. So I did try different strategies. And um, what I did was, uh, one of the first things I did was to uh, stand behind the students while they were on the VR headsets. 
So I could see on the screen what they were seeing in the headsets on the laptop screen. So I would point out every things. So I would say, hey, look at the environment. Look at the dinosaurs here. You know, uh, do you remember that I asked you about, you know, this about the dinosaurs? Well, you could see it here in the experience. Um, so as a result, when I did that, there was a, now I saw a bigger jump in what the kids were learning, about a 32% increase from about 40% to, I think it was 72% on the post quizzes. Uh, I also asked the students how they felt about virtual reality. And uh, it was a little survey question at the end. And what I found out is elementary and high school students really like using virtual reality. Uh, the, the, the information was 80% so of them preferred virtual reality over traditional classroom instruction. Um, so this is something that educators and administrators should consider is I hear all the time that we want to get kids excited about learning. And evidently, VR is one of those things that can turn uh, some kids on. Now, not everyone. You notice that uh, there were some children that I surveyed about 15% that had no opinion um, or was, I think 5% that didn't even like it. Um, but I'm saying overall, there was definitely a feeling that they would they would rather learn in virtual reality rather than just having some teacher up at the front of the classroom lecturing. In 2019, things have shifted. Uh, like I said, from about 2017 to 2019, Unity gave incredible out of the box support. Okay, for developers that want to create VR experiences. Uh, it was just so easy to just drop what's called a first-person controller in a scene and you're running around in VR or a vehicle uh, script in there and you were driving around. In 2019, Unity shifted to something called a new XR VR plugin. Um, and this was done, I think, to give developers a little more control over the VR experience. For example, um, you can program all the buttons on the controllers. Uh, using the new XRVR system, which I think is really cool. Um, you can grab and manipulate objects in VR more easily. It's called grabbables in the new XR system. Um, the problem is that it's a lot more difficult to use. It's a lot harder to learn how to use the XR system. Uh, also, the Extremality plugin that I use to create multiplayer simulations has not been updated to the new XR system. So creating multiplayer uh, VR simulations with versions of Unity after 2019.4 uh, is a lot more difficult. Uh, the, good news, the good news is, is that um, um, there are developers that are trying to create uh, multiplayer experiences using the new uh, XR system. And one of them um, is a guy named... Gabmeister, if you search for him on the internet, just Google search, his, his websites will pop up. Um, he is a developer and he's playing around a lot with how you do virtual reality with the new XR system and adding in multiplayer components. And uh, he has a Patreon page, which I subscribe to, but here's a screenshot that I took of some of the work that he's doing. He's getting full avatars in there. In fact, that seems to be for a while, there was a trend towards just doing the hands and the head and the body of an avatar um, and forgetting about the legs. And I know why VR developers were going in that direction. Uh, if you're designing just a sim to run on a headset, you've got to optimize the daylights out of it. Um, and adding full avatars slows things down. The other issue is um, in VR, obviously, you're the headset is your head and then you get these controllers which are your virtual hands that control it but what do you do with your feet um unless you use inverse kinematics um you're going to have legs that are just sort of dangling onto the body which sort of looks goofy um and i've tried downloading some inverse kinematic software and i've had trouble running it um again you know you got to be a sophisticated technician in order to try and get it to work um yeah, I know. Um, we're all used to Second Life, where we have full avatars that are animated as we're running around. And um, a lot of these VR simulations 
where you just have the head and a body and some arms just feels odd. It doesn't feel all that immersive. By the way, you, you may have noticed uh, on the screen captures from Horizon, they are using full avatars, but it's sort of like Gumby. You know, your legs are just, or your arms just sort of glide over the floor. Um, they're not using the inverse kinematics because they're trying to, uh, you really simplify, you know, what the, what the processors are doing in these headsets. So that was 2023. In 2024, I decided that um, I was going to be shifting from the Jurassic to the late Cretaceous uh, because I wanted to get into T Rex and Triceratops and all the cool late Triceratops uh, dinosaurs. And again, I worked with uh, Erin um, out in uh, Dinosaur Ridge. She was great. I'm, I'm so fortunate to have help at both Dinosaur Ridge and the Virginia Museum so I can focus on getting the technology to work rather than all the science. Aaron handpicked not only the dinosaurs, but said, here are the models that I want you to use. It was over $1,000 in models I had to spend, but they looked great. And Adam Pritcher gave me the content. He said, here's what you should say about each one. Um, unfortunately, it was single player. I couldn't get the multiplayer to work in time, so I said, the heck with it. Um, I'm just going to do single player experiences, which turned out to be actually a good idea. Um, in 2023, by the way, you notice my website, www.evwllc.com. Um, if you want to contact me, if you want to get any of the information here, uh, whether it's screen captures or my reports, go to that website. Um, my latest report isn't on there. Uh, it's also got my contact information there, so you can email me. If you want to get further information about other questions. Um, so anyway, 2024 comes uh, the dinosaur days and it's really cool. They do these dinosaur festival exhibits where they go through and they pull out all this material in their collections and put it on display. And they have, um, they'll also have members of the staff. Here's uh, Ari Dr. Ariana Kuhn, who's actually a herpetologist um, talking about mass extinctions. And they pulled out, you know, different fossils from different time periods. Um, so it was really cool to get be able to go around and talk to members, uh, staff members at the museum uh, during those festivals, as well as sharing my virtual reality simulations. And uh, here's a picture of our exhibit or well, the exhibit that I put together. Again, I had four people helping me um, to run it, which I really needed. Uh, it was sort of an onslaught. 2023 was magical. You know, they were coming in drips and drabs, and I don't think there was any more than a five-minute wait. In 2024, we just had tons of people descending trying to do the VR stuff, and it was pretty much an overwhelming experience. I tried to get as many kids as I could in the headset and guest but there were just really too many. And I'm, I'm fortunately, not everybody who came uh, was able to try the VR thing. Um, operators saying, well, yeah, I try not to meddle with kids in multiplayer games. Um, actually, I think that multiplayer games is where kids should be. Um, there have been surveys of business leaders, and they've talked about what skills they want people to have, future employees. And there are things like, um, we want them to be creative. We want them to be able to collaborate. We want them to be able to communicate effectively. And what's the best way of doing that is multiplayer games, I think. Um, I think that kids should not only be playing multiplayer games. I think that they should be um, creating their own multiplayer games. And uh, I just went back in this morning. I tried to create my own virtual world on Meta's Horizon platform. And... I was able to create a virtual world, um, but it's really tricky. You've got to have your accounts and everything set up just right to go in there and edit it, put the content that you want in. Um, I think Meta is worried about ch children developers. It looks like they want people 18 or over. I may be wrong about that to develop their own virtual worlds. But I, I, I don't think, you know, having professional developers create content is what it should be about. You know, if we can get kids actually making their own content, that would that would be a better thing. So here you see a, a parent and a student in the VR head up, headset doing the late Cretaceous sim. Um, 
I basically asked, uh, there were 111 guests or families that took part in this study um, that did a pre-quiz and then I put them in the virtual reality simulation. And then I did a post quiz. And uh, there were a couple of surprises. First off was that I did, in terms of families learning more about dinosaurs and dinosaur ecosystems, um, I think I had more people um, doing better. So there was like a 32% increase. The big shocker was um, the feeling that I got from parents, even though they were all told, hey, this software is intended, this hardware is intended for children 13 or maybe 10 years old. Um, the average age of children that were trying it was 11. 87% um, of participants showed some crease in their dinosaur knowledge, but I had children as young as two trying it. Um, and I had families coming up and that you'd put the VR headsets in and the parents would take shots of the kids in the VR headsets and I turned to one parent saying, I think forget about um, having pictures taken with your kid at Santa. It's, um, I want to get a picture of my kid in a VR headset. So I felt that overall there was a lot of support um, for, um, you know, by both the parents and the children in uh, virtual reality. It's ready. I think parents and kids are ready for Ready Player One. Picture with a VR saying, oh, I like that, sis. <laughs> All right, so what's coming up next? Well, if you're familiar with geologic time, okay, um, you know that there, there are three geologic time periods in the Mesozoic. I did the Jurassic in 2023. I did the late Cretaceous in 2024. So the only one that's left is the Triassic. And so that's planned for next year. I've already started to get some dinosaurs and landscapes put together. Um, I've joined the Southwest Paleontology side and uh, was connected with uh, Jenny Borst at Ghost Ranch down in New Mexico. And uh, she's been amazing giving me suggestions as to what should go in the Triassic simulation. Basically, the Triassic doesn't have as many dinosaurs. You have Coelophysis, and that's about it. Um, and I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a skull of a phytosaur, these things that sort of looked like alligators and crocodiles. Um, so they're going to be in there. And Jenny made some suggestions as to what kind of phytosaurs to put in with the coelophysis. But the big comment that I heard from uh, children that were doing my VR simulations is they want a pet dinosaur. They want to be able to, and, and this is natural. If you're in a VR environment and you've got virtual hands as well as a head, they want to be able to reach out and pet the dinosaur is what I heard. So that's coming in 2025. The other thing is I've gotten better with, um, I've gotten better with uh, animation controllers in Unity. So uh, one of the things that I did is uh, keyboard controls. So if you type the letter D on your keyboard, um, then the animal, the, the, the seal physis will drink. If you type the letter E, it'll eat a lizard. Um, so there's some really cool things you can do with the animation controllers in Unity, um, as well as having your own pet dinosaur. And I, I put some wooden logs in there because when I think of the Triassic, I think of petrified forests in Southwest US. Oh gosh, dinosaur litter box. I just did my cat's litter box. I don't want to think about a dinosaur litter box. All right, so I've got some conclusions that uh, I'm going to throw out here. Uh, VR is very popular with K-12 students and is a valuable tool for assisting teachers. It's, it is not a black box. It's not something where we just throw VR headsets um, with link cables and, and gaming rigs into the classroom and expect kids to magically learn. Um, it's like an active board. It's a tool to use teachers. You, you can't take the teachers out of the equations. Um, students are ready for Ready Player One. Parents are supportive teachers. Um, I was wishing that I'd see more support in schools, but I don't. Um, it seems like museums are more interested in this. And I've gotten some great feedback. Obviously, the Virginia Museum of Natural History is supportive of me in terms of giving me the venue to present this, as well as one thing I want to throw out is they've also been great in putting up myself and my team in a hotel room 
on Friday night, which can get expensive. Um, also appreciate working with uh, Aaron uh, LeCount out in Dinosaur Ridge and Jenny Brock at New Mexico. They're all giving me great information. Um, I've also contacted the Dinosaur State Park in Connecticut and Mike Rossi, who's the main park ranger there, is also interested in doing virtual reality simulations, although he wants to use Unreal. So I have a meeting with him in October uh, to talk about these simulations, both on the computer and VR, to educate the public about uh, dinosaurs and their ecosystems. And to me, um, I don't know if you realize this, I've looked at the Virginia Department of Education standard, science standards for Wyoming and Montana and, and uh, Maryland and so on. And the big shocker is that um, uh, even though some of these states have a lot of, of dinosaurs in them, um, I don't see dinosaurs even mentioned in, the, uh, in many of these uh, sta science standards. Um, it seems like uh, most schools are going for environmental science. And my argument would be, that's fine, uh, use dinosaurs to teach. Uh, ecosystems, because what better ecosystems can we discuss than those with dinosaurs, where you have everything from plant, autotroph plants right up to apex predators like uh, Allosaurus and T. rex and, um, you know, some of those animals. So it's a great way to, uh, uh, you know, to teach uh, environmental science principles. I did that once. I taught environmental science once. And so I know about ecosystems and niches and all that. Um, I still prefer doing earth science. All right, and before we get to questions and answers, uh, I thought I'd throw this out in case you don't know. Um, I've got three nat virtual natural um, history museums on Second Life. I started with doing one for the virtual Virginia Museum of Natural History. Then I add one from the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History. And then lastly, since uh, 2022, I did the Morrison Museum out in Denver. Um, they are all on the Vertex Sim, and if you haven't been to them, all you got to do is hit me up with an IM, and I will be happy to uh, uh, send you the uh, a landmark to them, and uh, feel free to go through. And you can go through at any time. Sometimes I do tours. It takes about an hour for each museum, um, but you can go anytime, 24-7, 365. All the museums have posters describing the exhibits or note cards um, so that you can go. Yeah, Delia says she's been to two of them. I guess the, the Virginia and the Cincinnati Museum have been around for a while. The Morrison is the latest one. And what I did with the Morrison is um, not only did I reproduce the exhibits at the museums, but I reproduced the museum itself. Uh, the Morrison Museum is nothing more than a couple of log cabins that are connected. So um, I, I want to do a shout out to Beth Ghost Raven, who sent me a, um, who sent me uh, a, uh, I guess a log cabin that I used to create this. So yeah, I'm already getting some requests for, um, for the LMs. So happy to, to shoot it to you. All right, and um, yeah, I think that's it. So. Uh, if you have further questions for me, feel free to email, email me at wschmackdeberg at gmail.com. I check that every day. Um, and it also goes, if I'm not online, um, I can, um, I can, um, it goes to my email. Uh, yeah. As Second Life IMs go to my email and then the emails go to my watch. So I get, I get back to you really quickly or go to my website www.lc.com. It's got um, it's got my uh, contact information. It's got some of my reports uh, there, and um, along with other projects that I'm working on. Oops. Yeah, I'm getting requests already for um, for the LMs, which are cool. Um, yeah, um, thank you all for coming. Um, I always enjoy these and I, I appreciate the feedback. And one of the things, um, I know people like coming to my museums. Uh, one of the things that we are still wrestling with is uh, the software itself. So 
I've got dinosaur simulations for the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Um, sometimes I'm asked, you know, how do I get my hands on that? Right now, they're, they're all still in beta. Um, so if you want to be a beta tester and you'd like to uh, either try that, there's a PC version and there are VR versions. So if you've got a gaming rig, Quest 2, and a link cable and want to try the VR versions, let me know. I can send you the download links for that. Or if you just want to try the PC versions, I could do that as well. Um, surprisingly, I have not had a lot of requests to be beta testers. Um, and like I said, if, if you're interested, then, um, um, you know, just contact me. Thanks. <laughs>